from Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide. I'm David Weston. Welcome to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. The brief today is all about the Fed, with Peggy Collins in Washington on what the Fed did and why Jay Powell says that they did it. And Abigail Doolittle right with me here in New York on the strong reaction in the market. So, Peggy, first of all, lay out for anybody who doesn't know exactly what the Fed did this morning. So the Fed did what's called an intermeeting cut, and they did it at 50 basis points. They could have gone with 25, but they did a 50 basis point cut. This is also the first cut outside a regularly scheduled meeting that we've seen since the financial crisis. So essentially, the Fed came out today and said, we understand that there's concerns in the economy about how the coronavirus could unfold and what that could do to the economic outlook. We're still monitoring the situation. We think some of the fundamentals of the U.S. economy are still strong, but we're adding some um, essentially cushion and insurance in the U.S. economy by doing what we can and cutting 50 basis points before we meet. And they were next scheduled to meet just March 17, 18. So essentially coming out today and saying we're using the tools that we have and we will keep monitoring the situation. So Peggy, this comes on a day that the G7 finance ministers and central bankers all got together on a teleconference call and t talked about what they needed to do with coronavirus. Is it just a coincidence it happened today or might there be some connection? That's right, David. So essentially, the, the finance ministers, as you said, led by Mnuchin, because the U.S. is the host country for the G7 meeting that's scheduled for April, had a call this morning to talk about the coronavirus and the effect on the economy. And then, as you said, only hours later, we saw the Fed come out and say that they were going to cut. So certainly, and Powell said this this morning, that they are talking to each other. He's talking to other central bankers around the world. We think this move by the Fed today will put more pressure on other central banks in developed economies to potentially make a move. There was some talk in the markets about whether or not central banks would make a coordinated move. The Fed obviously moved first, so we'll be looking to see what happens next with the ECB, BOE, Bank of Canada, etc. So, so, Peggy, did uh, Jay Powell, the chairman of the Fed, explain why this particular move will address this particular problem? Because it's clear he admitted this is not going to address supply chain problems. This is not going to stop the virus from spreading. Right. So it was clear that the Fed was saying, look, we are doing what we can to potentially create some more liquidity in the system. The Fed's cut on interest rate could help some banks continue to provide credit to small businesses, for example. But he was very clear today that it's fiscal policy and coordinated fiscal policy that is going to be able to help most in this situation in terms of the coronavirus and that health policy. Health experts are going to be what's really needed here in terms of the uh, in terms of helping a situation that is really a public health crisis. He also went well out of his way to say this is not a political decision. This is our mandate that we're uh, pursuing. This is not a political decision. At the same time, as you said, Steve Mnuchin was on that call. He's a political appointee. And now we have the president of the United States, as I understand, saying that's very nice, but it's not good enough. That's right. So Trump came out and tweeted this morning that he thought the Fed should cut even more. Mnuchin was at a hearing earlier this morning where he seemed to be positive in terms of what the Fed was doing. But really, as Powell said earlier, and as we're hearing from experts in the field and trader and analyst reactions, fiscal policy is going to be very important here in terms of the government reaction to containing the crisis, making the economy and people in the economy feel like they have this situation under control and that our health experts are able to respond to it Appropriately. And Peggy, of course, you don't only cover the Fed, you cover the U.S. economy more broadly. Talk about the fiscal possibility, because one of the things I hear increasingly is in fiscal policy, unlike monetary policy, it can be more targeted. For example, a lot of people are concerned about small businesses across the country. If their hourly employees can't come to work, if they have to stay home with children, for example. That's right. So in terms of fiscal policy, there's several things that people are looking at. There could be a tax cut, for example. There could be extra loans given to small businesses, potentially, or credit if, for example, a number of their employees have to call in sick in terms of paid sick leave. There's other issues that small businesses might encounter in terms of supply chains being disrupted and potentially needing some additional liquidity to cover the gap of a supply chain being disrupted in China, for example, if they're not able to get shipments. So there's a number of things that people are looking at there in order to provide some bridge while we deal with the spreading virus and then hopefully get it under control for people's health ultimately. Spreading virus and also, I must say, spreading uncertainty. And one of the questions I think people are looking for any indication of where things are, is there a risk here that because of this surprising cut of 50 basis points, people will say, oh my goodness, they must know something that I don't know. It may be worse than I thought. 
Well, I think that's a risk, and certainly I think that markets have jumped on the news and then have turned downward in terms of stocks. But at the same time, they moved up strongly after Powell came out again in a rare statement on Friday saying that they were monitoring the situation. So I think it's a fast-moving target as the virus spreads. People are trying to do the best they can to react to it. But as you said, it is a situation where people are very nervous. Panic is, a pro is an issue, and so policymakers are trying to show a united front saying we're monitoring the situation and as the Fed did today we're using the tools that we have but monetary policy is limited in its ability to respond to a public health crisis and that raises the question those policymakers that you refer to is there any move afoot in the administration or up on Capitol Hill maybe even together to say you know what Jay Powell's done what he can do we have to step up on the fiscal side well, that's certainly what we're watching for. I mean, this is a time when potentially government could come together from both sides to say, look, we need to potentially inject some uh, economic confidence and potentially even liquidity in the system. Certainly tax cuts are something that the government has talked about. But it will also de be determined how much of an impact this really has on the economy. On, on one hand, people seem to be spending more potentially to stock up on goods before potentially people have to work from home more if that happened. But on the other side, we have supply chains being disrupted and potentially businesses having trouble either with workers working from home or not being able to get what they need to to for travel restrictions or people um, lowering their travel expectations. So it's, it's a moving target and we'll be monitoring the data to see what actually happens in terms of economic indicators and the jobless claims, things of that nature to see how the impact is unfolding. Okay. Okay, Peggy, thank you so much for reporting. That's Peggy Collins reporting from Washington. And now let's come back up to New York and Abigail Doolittle to talk about that market reaction because there's been a real reaction. Yeah, there certainly has been a reaction. Very volatile markets here on the day. And you really nailed it on the head, I think, in terms of traders and investors wondering whether or not uh, this, what does the Fed know, that they're making this emergency Fed rate cut of 50 basis points two weeks before they could do it at their March meeting. How bad is it out there? Pretty unusual. Some folks are also raising the idea that there's moral hazard here that the Fed is taking this sort of action and that the current economic data really does not make the case for it, trying to stir the animal spirits. And others are making the case that this sort of a Fed rate cut really can't help with this current situation right now because economists are saying it's more of a supply chain shock, not a demand shock. So a Fed rate cut isn't going to help around the supply situation all that much. So what you would think they're trying to do is really stoke the psychological aspect, those animal spirits. The fact, though, that we at this point have stocks down suggests that investors don't don't have a lot of confidence. That being said, do take a look at the emerging markets. They are up sharply. Emerging markets tend to do much better uh, with easy money liquidity. So we are seeing that reaction today. Abigail, what about sectors? Particularly banks typically don't do well with lower interest rates. Yeah, you're right about that, David. We do have uh, banks on bottom relative to the sector action. In fact, the best sectors on the day are the high dividend yielding sectors because we have, of course, the 10 year yield on the day uh, close to 1%, a record low. So those utilities, real estate, consumer staples that offer a better dividend. Those uh, sectors are higher. Financials, on the other hand, really getting hammered by this. Concerns that banks will have an issue or problem uh, making money off of this Fed rate cut. In fact, the 10-year yield today, David, at the lows, shedding 14 basis points, the most going all the way back to 2009. So tremendous volatility. Volatility breeds volatility. It tells you markets, uh, participants and traders, very uncertain. They don't know what's next. Uh, and they're not feeling so confident right now in the Fed. One thing I haven't had the opportunity to look at is the yield curve. What's happened to that? Flattened? Uh, a little bit, and that's something that it would also be of concern to uh, the Fed. It actually, a Fed rate cut should uh, help normalize it a little bit, and we're not seeing that to the degree uh, that some folks may want. So another reason to question uh, what the movement was here for the Fed. Okay, Abigail, thank you so very much. That's Abigail Doolittle on the markets. And now we turn to Mark Crumpton for Bloomberg First Word News. David, New York State has confirmed its second case of coronavirus. Officials say a 50-year-old man who works in Manhattan and lives in Westchester County has been hospitalized. Governor Andrew Cuomo says the man had recently traveled to Miami, but not to any country with an ongoing outbreak. It's also not clear whether he had been in contact with anyone who had been infected. Tornadoes ripped across Tennessee early today, killing at least 19 people and destroying about 40 buildings. One of the twisters caused severe damage in downtown Nashville. Schools, courts and transit lines were closed and some damaged polling stations were moved only hours before Super Tuesday voting was set to begin. 
The United Nations nuclear watchdog says Iran has more than tripled its supply of enriched uranium in the last three months and now has more than a ton stockpile. That's in violation of that landmark 2015 nuclear deal with world powers. Iran has been slowly violating provisions of the deal in the hopes that other nations will pressure the United States to lift sanctions against Iran. A fight between Greece and Turkey over migration flows is heating up. The two countries exchanged barbs over human rights and border security today. Greece's prime minister called Turkey, quote, a trafficker after Ankara said it won't stand in the way of millions of migrants on its soil if they seek refuge in Europe. Turkey's announcement unleashed a wave of arrivals at the Greek border who were met by police and soldiers denying entry to thousands. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thanks very much, Mark. Coming up, we talk preparedness with the Director of Emergency Medical Services for the County of San Diego, Dr. Christy Koenig. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. we can do this together. Rallying the country together to defeat Donald Trump. To heal this country and then to build something even greater. In the name of that very same goal. I will be casting my ballot for Joe Biden. Joe Biden. Joe Biden. We need you. We want you. And there's a place in this campaign for you. So join us. What a difference a couple of days makes. Joe Biden welcoming his former rivals, Pete Buttigieg, Amy Klobuchar, and Beto O'Rourke, into the fold last night at a rally down in Dallas. Now Super Tuesday is underway, with voters leading, uh, heading to holes across 14 states and one U.S. territory. Will that last-minute show of force be enough? Bloomberg Chief Washington Correspondent Kevin Cirilli joins us now with the latest from Washington. So, Kevin, I'm not going to ask you to predict, but, boy, it is a big <laughs> difference for Joe Biden. Massive difference. Three points that I would make here. First and foremost, I was talking with some sources connected to Senator Bernie Sanders' campaign, and they're poised to pick up several delegates tonight, and they've got their eyes on the prized possession of Super Tuesday, that, of course, being California, the state with the most delegates at play. Second point I would make is keep your eye on Texas. Beto O'Rourke, the former congressman turned Democratic presidential candidate, throwing his support behind former Vice President Joe Biden. And they're looking for an upset in Texas that they would be able to pull that off. If Biden wins Texas, it's going to be a long, long battle toward the nomination. The last point that I would quickly make here, David, is that Joe Biden, within the last 48 hours, was able to solidify all of the support of the Democratic establishment. It makes it very, very interesting now for the convention fight as this becomes the progressive base versus the party establishment and Sanders versus Biden. David? Okay, thank you so much to our Chief Washington Correspondent, Kevin Cirilli, who's going to be with us right through the night covering this Super Tuesday. Who else is going to be with us? It's going to be Rick Davis. He's our political contributor here at Bloomberg. He's also uh, was the manager of Senator John McCain's presidential campaign. Rick, welcome back. Good to see you. Thank you. So what are you predicting? Well, I think it's going to be a, a long night. As uh, Kevin pointed out, California is a huge prize. It's the number one state uh, with almost 20 percent of the entire delegate load uh, between now and the convention being at risk tonight. Um, uh, it's going to be tricky, too, because they've had, you know, a number of uh, probably four, five weeks of voting already, uh, even before Super Tuesday. And so all those votes are going to have to be counted in addition to whatever shows up at the polls today. So it's going to be a long night, but I think a very competitive one. At the same time, a lot of places, Texas, for example, yesterday said they have a million votes that are already in because of early voting. California has that as well. Might that dampen a little bit whatever surge Joe Biden might get? Sure. And there's no question that with Biden's victory in South Carolina, he was catapulted into being the sort of uh, establishment hope against Bernie Sanders. And there's no question that that win uh, has been starting to reflect itself in the polling data. The question is, is it too late to have a sizable impact on certainly California, but Texas is an interesting question because Biden had always done well in Texas mm -hmm. and his numbers were depressed after, you know, three straight losses in the first three primaries and, and bolstered then after the fact. So it, there's a real question of competitiveness there. My guess is that the, the, the surge he's feeling now is probably going to put him in at least a very competitive framework. And understand, too, all these are 
proportional states. There's no winner take all. So as long as he's picking up delegates, even if it's just closely behind Bernie Sanders, he keeps Sanders from being able to surge ahead of him and keeps keeps track of the nomination. Well, and that's the question in part, Rick. I'm curious about this because it's pretty likely, it looks like right now, that Bernie Sanders will get more delegates tonight than Joe Biden will. The question is how many more? I mean, what's the what's the band that Joe Biden has to stay within the distance behind uh, behind Bernie Sanders. Well, look, not all the states are like Texas and California where they've had early voting. And so you, I think you can anticipate Biden picking up a lot of states. The South uh -huh. is a solid place for him. Uh, he's doing well in probably 10 of the 14 states. I, I could I could see him winning the lion's share of those states. Hmm. Now, they're the smaller states, you know, larger concentration of African-American voters and elderly voters that are the, his sort of uh, core constituency. But uh, I don't think you're going to see, uh, I think one of the, the outcomes tonight is a pretty close race between the two of them, and, and the delegate count is less important than, than the fact that the two of them have consolidated this, this contest. So one difference, besides having lost some candidates for tonight, is we have Michael Bloomberg, who is the founder and majority shareholder of Bloomberg here, who's actually on the ballot, first time he's on the ballot. Could he be a factor? Sure. Um, there's no question that he is going to pick up delegates tonight. You look at his numbers throughout the course of all these states. Uh, by carpet bombing this media campaign of his, he's been able to rise his, raise his numbers up to about 15 to 18 to 20 percent in some states. So he'll pick up delegates along the way. It's arguable as to whether those delegates would have been allocated to Biden if he had been able to pick up the Bloomberg votes. But as as we look forward to the future toward the convention. If Bloomberg comes out of today with a cache of delegates that he could be a power broker at the convention, it could change the complexion who's the nominee. Fascinating. It's been a long night. And by the way, Rick's going to be with us as well throughout the whole night. That is our Bloomberg contributor, Rick Davis. And even as primary voters go to the polls across the country, the looming threat of the coronavirus also hangs over us. Welcome now an expert on how to deal with medical emergencies. Dr. Christy Koenig is the EMS medical director for San Diego County. She is professor emerita of emergency medicine and public health at the University of California at Irvine, and she comes to us from San Diego. So welcome, doctor. It's really good to have you. I mean, we're all asking this question right now. What should be the protocol for dealing with p possible instances of, of this disease? What's the best way to get our arms around it? One of the most important things is to identify patients who are sick so that we can isolate them and protect them from spreading the virus to other people as well as taking care of them. So one of the things you're known for, as I understand it, is the three I's. Identify the one you just said as well as isolate once you're identified and then inform to let authorities know what's going on so we can get a sense of where there are hot spots. Is that universal throughout the country? Is that being communicated by the government? How do we know that our own local officials are following that sort of protocol? Yes, it is. In fact, the CDC, which is the authoritative scientific body, is promoting the identify, isolate, inform model. And what it means is when somebody comes in to seek medical care, we want to identify them right away before we go ahead and take the traditional vital signs like the blood pressure and the pulse where we would touch the patient. If there's a contagious disease where we first need to put on protective equipment, we want to identify them and do that first to protect both the patient and the healthcare providers. And then we would isolate them immediately so that they would not be spreading the disease to other people. And we have this in healthcare facilities, the ability to isolate. And the third eye is inform, meaning we want to let the hospital infection control people know and also the public health authorities so that we can help to manage this outbreak. You're an expert in public health. Do we have the rigor, the discipline, the consistency across the country to really enforce something like that? I'm sure some of the very big facilities do a great job, but can we rest assured that in fact this is being pursued throughout the country? It is indeed being pursued throughout the country, and as you point out, there are some areas with large public health systems, some areas with smaller systems. For example, here in San Diego, uh, we had a patient last night who went into a clinic, so not a hospital, and had trouble breathing and had had a recent visit to Japan. And so immediately, the systems that we had put in place uh, went to work. When the provider at the clinic called 911 to transfer this patient to the hospital, we had screening at the level of the 911 dispatch to identify that this person was at risk. And so when the paramedics responded, they wore protective equipment. 
They notified the hospital ahead of time. The hospital was prepared and had protective equipment and an isolation area. So there's an entire system we have in place that we looked at ahead of the event to be prepared. And this is an example of where it worked very well right here in the county of San Diego, as I'm sure it is across the country. And, and finally, just to be as specific as we can, how many confirmed cases of coronavirus do you have in San Diego County, and how fast is that number growing? We do not have any confirmed cases of coronavirus in San Diego County. We did have two patients who were in the repatriated group from Wuhan and were managed in quarantine on the military base, but that did not spread out into the community. But we do expect that we will have cases as for other parts of the country, and we want people to be prepared and educated. Okay, thank you very much. It's terribly helpful, doctor. That's Dr. Christian Koenig. She's County of San Diego EMS Medical Director. Still ahead here, we're keeping an eye on the markets after the Fed's emergency rate cut earlier. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. It's time now for a check on the markets. Stocks are off the session lows, but they are still in the red after the Fed's emergency 50 basis point cut. Kaylee Lines is here with more to explain all this to me. Yeah, it's been a very whipsaw day. We yeah. fluctuated between positive and negative territory. We are off the lows, but we're still down between eight tenths and one full percentage point. I think the market really is just struggling to understand how it feels about this rate cut, because to some extent, an aggressive policy action is what the market wanted to combat the coronavirus. But now there's a question of how effective is it really going to be? Because the Fed can only do so much with monetary policy. Is this now a fiscal question? How much can they really do anything about a supply shock? And the fact that they went a full 50 basis points two weeks ahead of the meeting, what does that tell us about what they're thinking of the health of the U.S. economy. So I think you're seeing that uh, make investors in equities at least sell a little bit, and they're now flooding into bonds. The bond market is telling you something much more decisive about the Fed's action today. I was just going to ask that. Tell me what the bond market is telling us today. I mean, yields are plunging all across yeah. the curve. That goes for the short end, which should be expected. That's really what the Fed mm -hmm. controls. The two-year yield is down about 16 basis points. But then also when you look at the longer end of the curve, which tells us much more about growth expectations, the 10-year yield is down 11 basis points, 106. I mean, we are on 1% watch. We're at record lows. We're at 1% watch. I mean, that tells you a lot about growth expectations going forward. Yeah, not a pretty sight, I think it's fair no, to say. not a pretty sight, too, for the likes of banks, which are really struggling Well, the banks today. are really getting hammered today, exactly <laughs> right, with those low interest rates, no question. Okay, thank you so much to Kayla Lines for that report on the markets. Up next, the Trump administration issues a warning to foreign actors. Keep out of Super Tuesday or be met with sharp consequences. We discuss with Jessica Brandt of the Alliance for Security Democracy. That's coming up next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on Bloomberg Radio. From New York, this is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Voters are at the polls and primaries across the country even as we speak. And since at least 19, 2016, the suspense hasn't been limited to who's going to win. There's also the question of how secure our system for voting is. Welcome now an expert on that subject. Jessica Brandt is the head of policy research at the Alliance for Security Democracy, and she comes to us today from Washington. So welcome. Great to have you with us. Uh, Thanks so much for having me. Before we get to the Russian question, which we'll have to get to sooner or later, let's talk about the Iowa question, because I was out there for the caucuses, and I didn't come away with a great sense of uh, confidence that people knew how to run these things. Should we be worried about our primary systems across the country today? Sure. So I think one of the key lessons coming out of Iowa is that the perception of insecurity can be just as damaging as insecurity itself. Um, I come from an organization that tracks Russian messaging in the overt space, and it was a flashpoint um, for Russia's efforts to paint our election as um, as uh, ineffective, our election system as ineffective um, and corrupt. And so, you know, we have to be concerned about um, mishap just as much as we have to be concerned about um, misdeed. So, so uh, are we confident that California can run a primary, that Texas can run a primary, that Virginia can? 
Yeah, what I see are you know election officials and federal officials across the country doing hard work um, to make sure that our, our votes are secure. Um, states have taken a lot of great and important steps, um, and I think 12 out of the 14 um, states where folks will vote today use machines that are paper-based, which create a verifiable trail. So that's great. Um, I do think that there are still some spots to watch, and that's Texas and Tennessee, um, where in some places folks will vote without a paper record. Um, and in California, um, you know, they've rolled out new balloting procedures there, um, including new machines in L.A. County that have come under some scrutiny um, for their, you know, for their security. Um, so those are the places that I'm going to be looking at today. But broadly, you know, I do have confidence that our um, that our officials are doing the hard work to secure our so, vote. So if we can be somewhat uh, secure in uh, in our confidence about the process, what about the misinformation? You referred to that earlier. That your organization really looks at that a lot. That certainly has been in the forefront, certainly since 2016, with the Russian uh, attempts to interfere with the with the system. Where are we now? Sure, and not least in the last, uh, I would say, 10 days. Um, look, I think recent developments and the reports that we've seen um, are, in some, to some respect, not really news, right? We have multiple reports from senior government officials going back um, for a long period of time now, indicating that Russia seeks to interfere in 2020. Um, so the fact that, you know, that they are doing that and that the primaries, you know, are also a target is not a surprise. Um, as I mentioned, my, you know, our team looks at um, Russian state-backed uh, accounts on Twitter, um, so diplomatic and government accounts, and we look at, um, you know, Russian state media broadcasts and, um, and news websites. And we do that so that we can see, you know, what the Russian narratives that the Russian government are promoting right out in the open. Um, and we've seen for some time efforts to paint our primary process as um, rigged by um, by elites in the party and um, in the Democratic Party and um, by the corporate media um, efforts to. You know, divide Democrats um, one from another, um, you know, both emphasizing the centrist and progressive split and the split within progressives. And I would say, as I mentioned before, the Iowa caucus um, debacle was really was really a flashpoint um, for some of those efforts. There we saw um, attempts to, for example, paint the delay in reporting results as part of a, um, you know, a conspiracy to deny Senator Sanders a clear victory and, you know, emphasizing, you know, um, conspiracy theories about mm -hmm. ties between other candidates um, and the app company. Um, you know, but I think what's important is that this is really not, it's a mistake to view this as, as just about um, a particular candidate um, or party, that it's really about a much broader effort where Russia's underlying goal is to paint our democracy as feckless and ineffective. Um, you know, for reasons that have to do with their own domestic politics, you know, Putin's desire to be able to, you know, speak to would-be activists at home um, and to dampen the appeal of democracy to them. Um, and also, you know, so in other words, to make us appear weak, um, but it's also to actually weaken us and to, to keep us um, distracted and divided from playing a, a, a broader global role that might be adverse to Russia's foreign policy interests. Is it Russia alone or are there other state actors? So I think that, you know, Russia uses these asymmetric tools, um, which of which information manipulation is one, cyber attacks are another, but, but there are more. Um, and they use these tools because they believe them to be at their advantage. And I think we should not underestimate the possibility that other actors um, will learn from um, learn from Russia's uh, operations and success um, and use those tools to their own interests. But what's important to remember is that they will use these tools to their own interests. So if we're only looking at this problem through um, the narrow political lens of our current political moment, um, we're at risk, I think, of, of losing the forest for the trees. Okay, Jessica, thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Jessica Brandt, she's head of policy and research for the Alliance for Securing Democracy. That's in Washington. Coming up, Fed Chair Jerome Powell takes action amid the coronavirus outbreak. We'll get the view from Capitol Hill with Rep Republican Representative Trey Hollingsworth from Indiana. That's coming up next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. The really big news of the day is that surprise emergency rate cut of 50 basis points by the Federal Reserve with Jay Powell giving us a press conference explaining why he did it. The markets, I think it's fair to say, have reacted not always in a good way. And Kayla Lines is here to explain it to us. 
You're absolutely right, David. We are off the session lows, but all three major averages here in the U.S. are still lower by more than 1%. Yes, many in the market wanted an aggressive response from the Fed, but now they have to weigh the efficacy of that 50 basis point rate cut. Will it really do much to combat the economic impact of the coronavirus? And of course, what the fact that the Fed acted two weeks before its meeting, what does that signal about the health of the U.S. economy? So that taking equities broadly lower today, though you are seeing some areas of outperformance in the likes of the utility sector. Uh, which, of course, is a high dividend paying sector. It's really a bond proxy, and that is getting a boost from the fact that yields are moving much, much lower today. On the U.S. 10 year yield, we're down by some 12 basis points, now around 1.03%. That is a fresh record low, and that puts us on 1% watch. Now, of course, it's not just the 10 year that's moving your C yields, moving lower all across the curve on the short end, which, of course, is uh, controlled by the Fed, but it is a monster move we're seeing in the bond market. Now, as for some other reaction to the Fed rate cut today. Well, one moving to the upside is the home building sector. Lennar is one of the best performers in the S&P 500 today. It is higher by some 4.4%. Of course, the lower rates mean lower mortgage rates. That could mean more people are buying houses, which gives a, a boost to a lot of these names, including DR Horton, KB Home, and Toll Brothers, which are all moving higher by between 1.5 and 3% a day. And one final group of stocks I want to check on, as it is Super Tuesday, is Managed Care. Those health insurers, they got a big boost in the session yesterday on that surge from Joe Biden with endorsements from Klobuchar, Buttigieg. The idea that maybe Bernie Sanders won't be the nominee, and thus there are lower odds of his Medicare for All plan taking effect. But you are seeing some of those gains from yesterday being given back today. Anthem, Cigna, United Health down by roughly 1% to 2% each. Of course, it isn't just politics that are at play. The coronavirus is as well. Our analysts here at Bloomberg Intelligence saying that for health insurers, should it become a pandemic, that could cut about 16% off earnings per share for some of these companies. So those are among those stocks moving lower on this down day for equities, David. Many thanks to Kaylee Lines. We're going to get the response from Capitol Hill to the federal rate cut. That's coming up next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Federal Reserve Chair Jay Powell explained the central bank's surprise announcement of a rate cut earlier today, saying it was all about their achieving their dual mandate. We're always going to make our decisions in the interest of the American people to carry forward uh, and, and try to achieve the, the mandates that Congress has given us. And we're never going to consider any political considerations whatsoever. We, we, will, we will not do that, and it's very important that the public understand that. For a view from the Hill, we welcome now Congressman Trey Hollingsworth. He's Republican of Indiana. Among other things, Representative Hollingsworth is a member of the House Committee on Financial Services. He comes to us today from Capitol Hill. So, Mr. Representative, thank you so much for joining us. What is your reaction to what the Fed did today? Look, I applaud the whole of government approach that's being taken here to prepare our economy, to prepare our health care system for any imminent threats that the coronavirus may pose. Uh, is monetary policy the most effective way to address it? This is actually something Ch Chair Powell talked about in his press conference. He said, look, frankly, we can't deal with supply chain interruptions with lower interest rates. We can't deal with some of the issues here. We can't stop the virus. Is monetary policy the best way? Well, it's a great question, and I think that the whole of government should be involved in this, and perhaps that means more of a fiscal response, perhaps it means a monetary response, but I think that approaching it from all different angles is hugely important. My grandfather used to say that a pint of sweat will sit today will save a gallon of blood later, and I think that this is the approach that the Trump administration and all agencies and government are taking to ensure that we are prepared from every dimension for the coronavirus. And the fiscal stimulus is one of the things that's really being asked about. Let me ask about something that's near and dear to your heart, which is small business. You're a small businessman yourself. You founded a small business. Correct. That's something you're really interested in. A lot of economists are saying right now, one of the big problems we're going to have in this country are the small businesses who, who live on a very short time frame. They, and they have to have hourly employees. If they leave, they can't be there. They could be really in trouble. Is there any movement afoot to give some fiscal stimulus to small business specifically? There's no movement afoot yet, but Congress is prepared to react should the situation grow even more dire. I think right now we are preparing for the imminent threat as that threat may grow in the United States from 105 cases today to something much larger. We will be prepared to react. It is our goal as representatives of the people, as servants of the public, to ensure that the public feels safe and that the public can go about their business and do all the things that we want them to be doing on a day to day basis. And in order to become safe, we have to know what the facts are. And it's very hard, let's be Correct. frank. 
I mean, this surprised everybody, as far as I can tell, around the world, the coronavirus. At the same time, are right. you confident that we are reacting aggressively enough simply on the information front? Are we testing enough people? Do we have a good enough read on exactly how many people have the coronavirus right now in the United States? Well, the reality of the threat is you should always be doing more. You should always ensure that you're testing more people. You should always be allocating more dollars towards research. I know that we've got a lot of smart people back in the Hoosier State. We've got a lot of smart people all the way across this country that are developing strategies on the healthcare front, developing strategies for the economy, but also developing strategies within the biotech industry to ensure that we have the capability to combat this virus should it continue to rise in its threat to the United States. What is the risk of a recession at this point in your judgment? I think it still remains fairly low. I don't believe that this has had a huge and long-term impact. The, the impact may be acute but short-term and hopefully a bounce back in the following quarter would be called for. So I don't think that the recession risk has risen dramatically, but I applaud the Fed in taking preemptive action to ensure that we stabilize any economic out outcomes because of this. What are you hearing from Hoosiers back in your home state of Indiana? What are you monitoring there specifically? What are you concerned about? Well, I think you hit the nail on the head. It is small businesses, small businesses that rely on imports from China. It is also our farmers that rely on exports to China that are going to be the most impacted. And I continue to monitor that situation. I've had several town halls, roundtables, and other discussions about how we can ensure that they stabilize their businesses, their products, and stabilize their customers' needs through this time period. I think that most people feel that this might be short-term, and we want to make sure that it is indeed short-term because whole of government is prepared for any potential dire outcomes. Should the government, government be acting right now to make sure that people have the money, have the resources to get the testing, to take care of themselves properly? Because as I understand it, people have to pay for these tests. Not everyone can afford $1,000, $2,000 for a coronavirus test. Yeah, it is a great point. We have to ensure that everyone who thinks they might be infected, everyone that's exhibiting symptoms, has the ability to get tested so that we can understand the pathogen and how it continues to evolve within our society. And so I want to make sure that everybody has the ability to walk in and get tested and get those results very quickly. That's hugely important so that we have a strong, very quick feedback loop to understand who has it and who they've come in contact with since they've had it. Where are we in the process of the supplemental now that President Trump originally asked for something over $2 billion, and then as I understand the Democrats said they wanted to have more than that. What's the number right now, and where are we in the process? When is it likely to be appropriated? I've heard uh, ranges from four to five billion dollars on the total number. I think that's being debated. I think the real question is, and what we have to make sure is that this is policy focused. The last thing I want is for those on the other side of the aisle to try to use this as a political moment to drive home their messaging inside the bill instead of focus on the real policy response that is necessary because of the threat of coronavirus. And I think that's the debate that's going on right now. What should be included and what should specifically be excluded from this? So, Con Congressman, I'm glad you raised that question of political of it because we hear that from both sides. I talked to Senator Dick Durbin of uh, Illinois just recently uh, who said that yes. he's concerned about politicization. This should be apolitical if possible. What is your sense right. of the political temperature up on Capitol Hill now? Can people on both sides of the aisle put this behind them and say let's just get the right thing done? I believe we can, and I think we've seen that time and time again where members come together to say, this is not about a party, this is not about a specific group of people, this is not about a geography, this is about us as Americans ensuring that the American public understands that all of government is focused on ensuring their interests are better off because of our representation here. So I think we've seen that over and over again. I want to see more of that. I work every day to ensure that we see more of that, but I think that the, that approach will prevail in this particular situation. Okay, Congressman, thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. That's your Republican Thank Representative you. Trey Hollingsworth from the state of Indiana. Staying up on Capitol Hill, voting is underway in 14 states and one territory, but today also marks the busiest day in the 2020 pre congressional primary calendar, not just for president, but for Congress as well, which includes primary challenges to two veteran Texas lawmakers and comeback attempts by five former members of Congress. Joining me with more now is Greg Giroux, our colleague from Bloomberg Government. So, Greg, let's talk about some of these. I mean, I'll pick one of my favorites right now. That's the former Senator Jeff Sessions, who's going back at it. And now what is his chance? Yeah, that's a marquee race. The Alabama Republican Senate primary, Jeff Sessions, who was a senator for about 20 years before becoming President Trump's first attorney general, is finding himself in a very close fight to reclaim his former seat, the seat now held by Democrat Doug Jones. Um, there are seven Republicans running in that Republican primary today, including Sessions, and there's no guarantee that Sessions is going to win the majority vote needed to avoid a runoff election on March the 31st. He's in a tough fight. 
Uh, let's talk about another veteran that's coming back or trying to come back, and that's Daryl Issa out in California. He's running, as I understand, in a different district from the one he represented for many years. What are his chances? Well, he is running in a district that's closer to San Diego than the district he represented for about 18 years, and he retired in 2018 from that district, which was trending Democratic. He very well may have lost that district in 2018, so he may have gotten out at the right time. Now, with Duncan Hunter resigning from Congress amid a corruption probe, uh, there's that Republican-leaning seat opened up. It's much more Trump-friendly, and we're seeing Daryl Issa running very strongly pro-Trump television advertisements. He is looking for a, one of those two spots in the November election. California has a top two primary under which all candidates of all parties run on one ballot. And the top two vote getters, regardless of party affiliation, advance to the general election. ICE is fighting one of those two spots. He may well get it. But California takes, uh, takes its time to count ballots. It may not be immediately clear tonight or even tomorrow if he makes that, makes that general election. Greg, we also have something of a, a fight going on between Democrats up in Massachusetts with the senator, Ed Markey, actually in a fight with a Kennedy. That's right. And that primary, actually, even though Massachusetts votes today for the presidential primary, they actually separate their presidential primary and their congressional primary. So their congressional primary is not actually until uh, until the uh, summer. But um, that race is already heated up. We've already actually had a debate between Ed Markey and Joe Kennedy. Uh, they don't really disagree much on the issues, but um, they're both progressives or liberals, however, whatever term you'd like to use. But um, it is much more generational, I think, contrast there. Uh, Ed Markey has been in Congress for about 40 years, and Joe Kennedy, um, one of the uh, sons of uh, a former uh, Congressman Joe Kennedy and a grandson of Robert F. Kennedy, uh, is just uh, in his uh, fourth term in Congress. Greg, one of the things we're watching closely today in the presidential primary is the state of Texas, which may well be in dispute. But tell us what's going on in the congressional races in Texas. Yeah, you have a lot of action going on in Texas. You have six Republican members of Congress retiring, three of them from very safely Republican districts. Uh, in one of those districts, you have President Trump's former physician, Ronnie Jackson, seeking to run in the Republican primary. You have Pete Sessions, a former longtime Dallas area congressman, uh, like ISA, who we mentioned before, is running in a different congressional district, one based in Waco. Remains to be seen whether Jackson and Sessions can win those primaries or even advance to a runoff, which would be held in late May. You also have three uh, open seats in uh, one in, uh, you know, one on the, along the border, one in Dallas Fort Worth, and one in, the, in suburban Houston. So six open seats there. And then you have Republicans trying to reclaim a couple of seats. Uh, in Houston, in the Dallas area, that uh, the Democrats won from Republicans in 2018. So, Greg, let me put you on the spot here. Uh, given what you know right now, uh, does the Senate stay Republican and the House stay Democratic, or could one of them switch? I think one or both could could switch. It's it's too early to say. We've got uh, we've got eight months until the election, the November election. That's an eternity in politics. I, the, the Republicans need a net gain of about 20 seats to win back the House. It's going to be very tough for them to do that. They would need a lift from the top of the ticket from President Trump. It also will depend on the popularity and quality of the Democratic presidential nominee, which, as we know, may not be known for some time. And as for the Senate, the Republicans lead the Senate 53 to 47 meaning the Democrats need a net gain of three or four seats, depending on the outcome of the presidential election. That's going to be hard to do as well. It's going to require the Democrats to unseat several Republican incumbents in the November election. Okay, Greg, thank you so much for that great report from Capitol Hill. That's Greg Giroux of Bloomberg Government. And now it's time for a check on the markets with Abigail Doolittle because they have been moving. Where are they now? <laughs> a real roller coaster right on the day. You know, on the open, we were down almost 1%. And then on the emergency Fed rate cut, we were up 1.5%, then down, up. Right now, we're down, although we're off of the lows, at the lows, down 2%. So lots of volatility around this emergency Fed rate cut. Traders, investors questioning what does the Fed know that they're doing this uh, two weeks in advance of their meeting where they could have done it? What is the motivation? Uh, and if it was to stir uh, the animal spirits or really invoke confidence in the uh, situation of the coronavirus tragedy, not really working right now, although I will date myself, ahead of Fed accommodation in 2008, 2009, the initial reaction
reaction to a Fed move, typically the markets then the next day go the other way. So if the initial reaction today is down, maybe tomorrow green, yeah. uh, we'll see. You're really dating yourself a whole 12 years. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not very sympathetic. What about sectors? Are they telling us anything or is this basically across the board? Well, you know, sectors really tell the story because, of course, we do have uh, rates falling, the 10-year yield right now down 12 basis points. And actually, earlier we were talking yield curve. I misspoke. It's actually steepening a little bit. You can even ah. make the case uh, that the, one of their motivations, as I had said, is to normalize the curve. Not a lot of that happening. When I say steep and not by a lot, uh, but from the standpoint of yields falling like that, weighing on the banks down more than 2% on the day, the top sector is not what you'd want to see. Interestingly, they're up in a big way, even on this big down day. Utilities, real estate, high dividends there. Uh, so it is really influencing the sector composition, probably not in the way that the Fed wants. But you know, a really interesting point here, David, is the Fed stepped in back in October on the trade war uncertainty, and they started this repo action because of liquidity right. issues. The markets went up basically 20%. We, on the last week, on the correction, are basically, we were down at the levels prior to that liquidity. So you could make the case that that move should never have happened. You know, what tools does the, the Fed have uh, next? So I think that some investors, again, questioning uh, the soundness of this Fed. And just to round it up, commodities, gold, things like that. Well, What's going on? Well, we have a big surge for gold. We have uh, yep. oil up, and overall, the Bloomberg Commodity Index is up more than 1%. So you have stocks higher, or excuse me, lower, commodities higher. That's a reverse of what we've been seeing, because in recent in recent weeks, we've talked often about one worrisome factor was the fact that commodities were down. But we, of course, have the dollar weaker, so that's helping out. Well, I was going to say, part of that's the dollar weakening. Th that that's drives it. up the price. That's exactly <laughs> right. right. But when you have mismatched uh, cross-asset checks like this, it suggests more volatility ahead because folks just don't know in the environment of the unknown around the coronavirus tragedy. Yeah, my goodness. Okay, thank you so much, Abigail. Great report. That's Abigail Doolittle. Coming up in coverage of the Fed and markets on Bloomberg Television and Radio. And in tune in to our special coverage of Super Tuesday tonight. We're going to have live analysis of the Democratic contest starting at 7 p.m. Eastern time. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio.